Anybody doing any hosting this weekend? I think we've got a Perspectives weekend. And we have lots of visitors coming for class on Monday. We might have a few people in this classroom on Monday and also in our S&P class on Monday. Um, and that usually means that uh, we have some students who will stay with you. Anybody hosting? Yeah? Okay. Hi, Victoria. Good morning, Gwen. important point, I, I talk to other faculty members because we are all, all faculty are writers. Right? We, we have to write in our fields. And, and it's always that same thing, like how do you get the, how do you get the ball rolling, yeah. right? And some people say, well, I need these really big blocks of time to yeah, get the ball rolling. Like half an hour to organize and write it. Like, yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Jake. 
There is inter interrater reliability. Allegedly, this is a relatively reliable instrument. Yeah. <laughs> Allegedly. Got 8.30, so why don't we get started? Good morning, Psych Stats. Good morning. That's pretty good for the end of week number eight. Who's ready for a weekend? Yeah? All right, all right. So uh, just to make sure we're all clear on where we're going, here we are in our syllabus. We're at the end of this week labeled 1019, and you can see that we're going to be talking about t-tests today after we've done just a little bit of review on multiple regression. We'll take a peek at what people did for the assignment that we had today on multiple regression. We'll also check in with I think it is Karen. Karen, we're on for Monday. Is that right? Okay. And I'm just going to pop that open so we can see what our few remaining students are. We're most of the way through with our student presentations. And we can just get a reminder of who's coming up in weeks to come. So we know we have Karen on Monday. And then the week after that, we've got Vanessa. And then we have Gabby uh, as our final student presentation. And then we'll have a couple of visiting speakers on the Mondays after that. One from OSU. And one is our own Julie Tucker, who's a graduate of this class and uh, graduate of Denison, obviously, from, I believe, 2009. She now works with Dr. Lowell Kennedy, the Vice President of Student Development. Okay, so lots of fun uh, talks coming up, uh, presentations from students. If at any point you'd like to be videoed, I'm always happy to make video recordings. If you'd rather not be videoed, that's okay also. Okay. What, oh, yes, please. So if you could sl uh, slide your PowerPoint in, or at least a, a version of it, into the work area. Uh, sometime on Sunday night, and on the syllabus, it's listed, I think it's 7 o'clock, but I might have that number wrong, but sometime Sunday evening, okay? What I, what I like about that is typically if students have that kind of a deadline, if they have something the night before, they'll often be scrambling right up to that deadline, and that's a good thing, because if that deadline is now 12 or 24 hours in advance of when you're giving the talk, you would otherwise be scrambling up until minutes before you gave the talk, right? So, so we actually want you to get the materials in and sleep on them, basically, so that the information is somewhat in longer-term memory by the time you're presenting it. And it's, a, it's a good habit to develop even in your, throughout your professional lives. Okay, one other bit for Monday after we uh, will have Karen's presentation, but before we do that, we'll have our journal club, and there is a TED-Ed ready to go on that, and I think you'll really enjoy this. It's about ANOVA, but I've also asked a couple of questions there that deal with some important concepts from multiple regression. Okay, so just to show you what the article is going to be like, and we're taking basically a tour of the different professors here in the, in the department. We have an article published by Dr. Sarah Hudson Como. Some of you may have taken courses with her. It's entitled Gender Stereotypes of Emotional Reactions, How We Judge an Emotion as Valid. Okay, and I think you'll find this to be really interesting. So you can click on that in the syllabus and go out to read that article, and there are the TED-Ed questions as usual. I look forward to having our, our discussion, and then we'll go to Karen's presentation. Okay? There'll be a couple of ideas in that Journal Club uh, TED-Ed, 
that are going to relate to multiple regression. And some of those ideas we haven't really flushed out yet. So what I'd like to do is begin by just picking up from where we left off last time. We were going to have students go into SPSS and use the GSS93 file, and they were going to create a bunch of models for us, a bunch of multiple regression models. And you might remember that the assignment, and I might even be able to project the assignment right here, the assignment was to use as your dependent variable respondent's income. And this, of course, was back in 1991, so the incomes are going to be you know, um, backward in time by uh, 24 years or so now. So they might be smaller, but that's what we're going to try to predict on the basis of four different predictor variables. And these were age, zodiac, as a variable that probably would do nothing for us, the participant's education level, and also their political party affiliation. Okay, so that's what we were going to do. And we were going to build this three different ways, using a standard model, using a stepwise model, and using a hierarchical model. Okay? And students, thank you for, for doing this. I, I took a peek, and several students put things into their assignment inbox. So what I have here is the output, and I just happened to use Melanie because she was, she was first alphabetically, right, okay? So I took a peek and I thought this all looked really good and I thought we might now walk through this. So let's go up to the top one, and what I really appreciate was Melanie was good enough to label the SPSS output with a particular kind of regression. So she did the stepwise first, okay? I wonder if we can have somebody step us through the stepwise. So um, we have these three boxes, correlations, model summary, and coefficients. Anybody want to walk us through um, what's going on here in the stepwise? We can do it box by box. It's okay if this is redundant, right? We'll do a little bit of review here. What's going on in the correlations box? Nicely stated, right? The, uh, the bivariance correlations and their statistical significance, right? Okay, these are the observed p-values, okay? And we can see which ones are going to be significant and which ones are not, okay? So that's um, always a good idea, particularly when we get to the issue today of um, variance inflation factor and tolerance and multicollinearity and so forth, okay? All right, can somebody help us out what's going on in the model summary, right? Looks like we have three things clicking there on the stepwise. So can you just walk us through what, what was generally going on there? Why do we have three lines in our model summary? Okay, thanks, Gwen. Um, because for each step, there's a variable added into the model that was kind of one, so that's why there's three lines because there are three different models. Okay. Okay, right. So there are, there are three lines here because we, we do have in each successive line an increment, a statistically significant increment by adding one other variable, right? So uh, we can see that here the predictors are uh, highest year of school completed and then for model B, the second one down, highest year of school completed and the addition of age of respondent, highest year of school completed, age of respondent and the party affiliation. That's how they, they made their way in. One of the variables didn't make it in. Which one did not make it? Unsurprisingly, Zodiac didn't make it, okay? So hopefully people can see. And I think that's always a, a fun one to keep in mind, right? So whenever you are reading some scientific article and somebody's trying to find the effect of one variable on another, it's always fun to think about, well, how would this compare to you know, a really, really low correlation variable like Zodiac? <laughs> and, and if you are, uh, the, the authors are not predicting much more than a Zodiac would predict, then uh, the authors are not saying very much, okay? All right, so that's the model summary. Now let's take a look at the coefficients, okay? And can somebody just walk us through what kind of information we would extract from this area, the unstandardized coefficients? What, what could we do with that information? Okay. What, what do we do with that, <coughs> the unstandardized coefficients? Okay, thanks. You can make the regression equation. Okay, right. So we could predict a, and we could predict a, uh, we could build a raw score regression equation, and we could do each of these as our coefficients, and then this one would be the b in y equals mx3, our, our constant or our y-intercept, and we could list that either first or second. And then over here we have the same thing for the z-score bit, okay? And we can, we can see that there are sig values associated with each of these, 95% confidence intervals, uh, and we have 
uh, zero and partial and part and, and so forth over here. Okay? Uh, I don't know if we have collinearity diagnostics on this one. Uh, looks like we didn't do that, and that's okay. I wonder if somebody else might have done. Did anybody click on collinearity diagnostics? Uh, it might be that we, we didn't. Let's take a look at one other student just to see if that may have come up. Let's go to the assignment inbox. Um, randomly, I'll pick Victoria. And we'll go to homework regression output. Okay. And it might be, okay, we don't have it there either. This is something that we hadn't talked very much about, but we'll, we'll show it to you inside of, inside of PowerPoint. In fact, why don't we go there now? We've had some conversation already about the three different flavors of these correlations, the zero order correlations and the partial and the semi-partial. We've had some conversation about that. I'm going to go to just the end of our 1022 PowerPoint. Okay, So here's the partials and semi-partials. We'll have some conversation about the collinearity problem. Okay? How many people have encountered this before, the collinearity problem? In some other course, maybe? Okay. So this actually relates to um, multiple regression, more so than bivariate regression. And this is the idea, as you can see here, that uh, collinearity is when we have overlap in our predictors. Okay? And that creates some problem for us. Over here, I, I have a simple diagram where we're trying to predict factor A. And this Venn uh, diagram, and we're using B and C as predictors of A. And over here, we have considerably more overlap than we do over here. Okay? This creates a problem that is somewhat confusingly referred to as collinearity, and at the same time, it is called multicollinearity. <laughs> so uh, those words are used interchangeably. So either collinearity or multicollinearity. Okay? So this has some overlap. It has higher levels of collinearity, and this is considered a problem very often inside of multiple regression. And we can get some regression um, statistics out of SPSS that I'll, I'll dial down to here. And all you'd have to do is inside of SPSS, when you're in that statistics button, you can click on any, kind, any number of output statistics. You can get means and standard deviations. You can click on the collinearity statistics, and you get this, this kind of a thing. Okay? So uh, let me introduce the two topics that are going to be important for us today. Uh, these are... Uh, tolerance and also variance inflation factor. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this idea of tolerance. Tolerance is a way of speaking about the overlap that we have here. Okay, it's a way of speaking about that, and it's defined with a very simple mathematical formula: one minus the overlap of this predictor with all other predictors, or one minus r squared. And this is available to you, by the way, on the 1022 PowerPoint. So if, if you don't want to take all that down, you have it. Uh, available to you out on the S drive. So the tolerance is going to range between 0 and 1. Okay? So if it were the case, well, let's, let's think about this. Let's take a hypothetical case here. Um, we're going to think about maybe the relationship between you know, this and this. Okay? And there's no overlap here. Right? There's no overlap between B and C. Is that clear for folks? So what would the R be, the, the correlation be between B and C? A simple R value. If I put B into XL and I put C into XL and I took those columns of numbers and said equals correlation, the R value would be zero. zero. Okay, are we all okay with that because there's no overlap? And if we square zero, we get zero. And if we do one minus R squared or one minus zero, we get one. Okay, so the tolerance can be all the way up as high as one, and that would look like this. Okay? And so our tolerance here would be high. A tolerance is just a, a statistic that tells you something about how much overlap there is. And we'll see why that matters when we get to the prediction in just a little bit. Okay? Sometimes we are interested in flipping that number around and taking the reciprocal of tolerance. Okay? And we call this the variance inflation factor. This is going to be, here are your collinearity statistics for each of your variables. Okay? And then right next to that, we have basically the reciprocal of that, or um, uh, 1 over tolerance. We'll give you the number that we have on the far right-hand side there. Okay? And we often will say that you know, a particular researcher might want a certain level of tolerance. They want uh, generally higher tolerances. They don't like the predictors to be too overlapping one with the next. And they have different cutoffs. So a fairly common cutoff might be something like 0.8. Okay? So uh, if there's a correlation of Point 0.8 between these two, we might say that they're, they're too overlapping and maybe we want to get away from using both of them. We might use only one, we might take an average of them. Okay? Uh, but we do get some trouble in our models, as we'll see in a moment, if there's too much overlap in our, our predictors. Okay? And people will use different cutoff values, 0.8 is one possibility. Okay? 
All right, let's see if we can get to the related idea of variance inflation factor, or VIF. You'll see this at different points. And this is simply 1 over tolerance, which would be 1 over the quantity 1 minus r squared <laughs> for all the other predictors. Okay? And this now, obviously, is going to go between 1 and infinity, okay, is how that's going to range. And I wanted to give you a visual intuition about what's going on here. Who remembers doing this when we were talking about uh, our descriptors early on? What did this mean? Early on the semester, we were plotting means, and what are these guys? Standard errors, okay, right? So you can have a standard error around your mean, and it can be narrower or wider and so forth. And generally, we like to have output that has relatively small standard errors, so we can say that we've got a lot of precision in that measure. You can put an error bar on your prediction line, and over here, we have a relatively tight error bar. That These little dots are not actually data points. They're, they're um, kind of like errors of the estimate. Right? They're kind of like error bars on this best-fitting prediction line. And see how tight that is. Right? So, so we might predict that for a given x, our y would be this, plus or minus a relatively small margin of error. Okay? And we can actually get that if our variance inflation factor is quite low. This is a measure of variance, and we can inflate it or not, depending on how much overlap there is down here. Okay? So there's a lot of overlap what we typically do is we penalize your estimate by saying, well, yeah, it might be the case that you're actually going to predict this, but now there's a lot of error there because we can't tell if that prediction is coming from B or from C, so we're going to say that your prediction is a little bit more uncertain. It's going to have a wider variability, okay? And the extent to which it's wider is given by this scaling factor, okay? If we had absolutely no overlap here, we'd be tolerance equals 1, We'd have a variance inflation factor. See if you can do this in your head with me. 1 over 1 is 1, OK? So we're going to multiply this by, we're going to multiply our error bars by 1, and we get exactly the same thing. And we're right back here. But if we're cheating a little bit, and our predictors are not entirely independent, one from the next, then what we get is some kind of penalty that we pay in our prediction. Like we're going to pay uh, a penalty that takes the form of having a less precise prediction. And so we're going to scale up our error by some factor greater than 1. Okay? It might be marginal greater than 1. It might be a lot greater than 1. And that's driven entirely by how much overlap there is. So as these guys overlap, our variance inflation factor is going to go up. And this is going to get wider and wider and wider. And your predictions will get less and less precise. Who's following all that? Does that work for us? That's a lot of information. Okay? But all that comes out, just when you click on collinearity statistics, you get this and this. Right? This is again, 1 minus r squared, right? when we're talking about how this one predictor overlaps with all the others. And then we just flip that around. We take the precipitate, and that tells us by how much we need to inflate our standard error. Okay. So it's pretty cool, I think, that we can get uh, some indication here of how much you want to inflate that. And of course, what happens is as these become more and more overlapping, this thing starts to spiral out of control. And really, you're not predicting anything with any precision. So in that case, what you might do is ditch one of your predictors. Just say, you know, C is not doing anything more for me than B is, so I'll get rid of one of them. Or you can take an average or whatever your, your context requires. Who's following all that? Okay. All right. So that's the idea about um, variance inflation factor. Okay. So we want VIF to be near 1, right? so we don't inflate our error bars any more than we have to. Okay. okay. All right. So that's pretty much the idea. Uh, here's a kind of a, a fun diagram. right? You, you're trying to predict something. And look at all the predictors that we have. We're trying to predict what's in that blue donut. And we have all these other predictors here. It's hard to know if that's a meaningful model. right? If you throw the kitchen sink at it, you throw everything you've got at it, um, it might not be that you've got a really interpretable model. OK. So on the TED-Ed for Monday, we're going to be doing a relatively simple ANOVA. Um, but you will see that at one point, there is a factorial ANOVA. And we're going to have, if you will, more than one variable doing the predicting on the dependent variable. And we can think about uh, to what extent those might be overlapping. Okay? And to the extent they're overlapping, we have a departure from, uh, we, have the, we have some collinearity, also called multicollinearity, that's going to give us a lower tolerance, which is a higher VIF. Okay. Questions about any of that? Okay, why don't we flip back over? I'll take a look at 
some of these other models just to see uh, how we were doing. So here's a regression model. This one is standard or simultaneous. Can somebody remind us um, what the coefficients are representing here in the standard or simultaneous model for MR? Multiple regression. Now, how are these different from uh, those of the stepwise model? Not numerically different, but just how, how is the, the reasoning here for the standard or simultaneous different than that of the stepwise? How does something get into the model in the standard case? Yeah, thanks, Jay. Okay, they're all entered at the same time, okay. And then what value do we assign to each of them? Anybody recall? They're all in. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, right, the unique contribution to the whole, right, the unique contribution to the whole. And somewhere in here, we're going to get some indication. We, we typically get a uh, R square over here, and it gives us some indication of what they're, all the variables collectively are doing. Can somebody remind us uh, why this number is a little bit smaller than that number? You mentioned that the last time. Why is the adjusted R squared slightly smaller? Okay, thanks. Um, if the sample size is small, we adjust it so that um, it's more generalizable to the Okay, great. If the sample size is small, they adjust it so that it is more generalizable to the rest of the, the population. If you have a relatively small sample, you probably didn't catch the most extremes in your population. But as you get bigger and bigger samples, you've got a better chance of getting that. So they scale this up in proportion to how large your sample is. And those two numbers are not that bad. So even at, you know, we're trying to represent 300 million Americans, and we've got about 1,000 people in here. That might sound like a really small fraction, but actually that's a, a pretty good representation. We get almost no change there. The standard error, the estimate, again, is going to be related in part to what we have cooking over here. Right? We have either tighter or not so tight margins of error there. Okay. All right. And then the hierarchical model, we, you were given a particular sequence to enter. Okay. So now we know that all of the variables are going to make it in. I am curious just to see how we did on Zodiac. I think that's going to be in here. Uh, predictors, age. Okay. And we go back up to the correlations, for example. Yeah, we're getting really, really small R values, unsurprisingly. Okay. And if we go down here to the coefficients, <laughs> the astrological sign, again, is going to be, you know, look how tiny that is, right? The R value is going to be 0.011. We're not doing really, really well with political affiliation. Did anybody go and unpack that? I don't know what direction that's signed in. I don't know if that is favoring Republicans or favoring... Democrats, but we could we could go back and unpack that and figure out from the data um, uh, whether that is suggesting that as you become more Republican, your income is going up, or as you become more Democratic, your income is going up. Okay. I don't know if anybody's taken a look at that, but you could take a look at how that variable was coded. Which side of their continuum was Democrat, which side was Republican? Okay, so that all looks good. And, and when I took a peek at what other people were putting in, I got the sense that you were able to get through your multiple regressions and figure out how to navigate all of those difficult, uh, those difficult menus. Something else, questions or, or comments about any of this before we go off the t-tests? Okay. All right, so just as a, a couple of parting thoughts on multiple regression, let me go to here. And I just thought I'd, I'd give us two pictures that might be somewhat iconic, okay? So here is Albert Einstein, who I believe was quoted as saying one time, elegance is for tailors. So some ti a scientist will care about um, uh, parsimony, and some will not. They want to know, how do we get the best prediction no matter what? They don't really care what the cost is. Okay? And this might be um, Einstein's perspective. He would say that you know, it, it might be the case that the universe is, is elegant, but the universe doesn't actually owe us elegance. It doesn't owe us parsimony. Uh, so I really want to know how to describe the universe most fully, and it might be elegant, but I'm a scientist. I'm not a tailor. Elegance is, is for tailors. Um, other folks are more practical, and they want to know just, you know, I want a model that down and dirty gives me a couple of predictors that are going to get me most of the way there, and I don't want to have to keep too many variables in my mind. Give me the variables that are giving the most predictive power. And um, so a very different kind of philosophy. All right. 
So if we have no questions on multiple regression, why don't we go over and begin to talk a little bit about your responses to today's set ed, which was going to be on issues relating to t-tests. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the very first question was for you to generate a novel example, and you can call up your TED ed if you want to see what your own response was. Call, uh, generate a novel example of a cognitive psychology experiment for which a one sample t test would be an appropriate statistical analysis. Okay? I wonder if anybody can get us going on that. Okay, thanks, Anna. Um, I said that like, you had participants um, memorize a list of words and you wanted to compare. Um, how they re remembered the words to like 50%. Okay. Then you could, like 50% would be the okay. like population mean. Yeah. Okay, so I, what I think I understand is that uh, we'll, we'll do a 50% over here, and if you knew that was your standard, right, mm -hmm. based on something in the literature, and this is a memory experiment, mm -hmm. uh, it might be that your folks are right about here, which is coming in a little bit low, but they might be within the margin of error there. Okay. All right, so a, a memory experiment with a, a reference at 50% recall. Okay, I think that works. Some, some other ideas. Cognitive psychology. How many people generated an idea that was memory based instead of cognitive psychology? Okay, Did anybody generate something that was not memory based for cognitive? Okay, we have, I think, two. Can we go with Karen just to hear some other topical variety? Um, I was looking at the overall GPA of psychology students versus general medicine students. Okay. Okay, the overall GPA. So, so GPA then is, becomes your, your indicator of cognition of some. Okay. Okay, right. And, and so how did that go? How did you work that into a one sample t-test? Um, the oh. psychology majors were like a small sample of the bigger population. Oh, okay, okay. So the bigger population is going to be your standard, right? Okay. And we'll see uh, if we were to go into SPSS and do a one sample t-test. We, we might not get there today. Uh, do a one sample t-test then you are asked to put in a test value, right? And so the test value would be, in your case, the GPA for the overall campus, and we'd see how psychology majors compare. Anybody have a, want a guess on that, how psychology majors would compare to the campus GPA? Psychology major GPA to campus GPA. What do you think, yeah? Okay, okay. Okay, all right, so, so one idea is that maybe in general, sciences are characterized by lower GPAs, and to the extent that psychology is science and, and aligns with all the scientific um, attributes, then you might expect that that would be lower. Right. Okay, all right, so that would be something we could test. Did you also, Gabby, have another idea about um, your, your T-test? Yeah, I used, uh, reading speeds. Reading speeds, okay. Okay. Okay, and and one of those two. So it might have been the paper was your standard. Yeah. Okay. So the paper, the reading speed for reading on paper is the standard, and we're going to compare that to reading speed on a screen, and we'll see if there's a difference there. Okay. All right. Really good. So I think we get the idea about that. Okay. Um, let's go on to question two. This is kind of interesting. And the question was, identify a situation that would prompt you to use a one-sample t-test rather than a z-test. So a t rather than a z. Anybody want to help us out with how they thought about this? And I tried to give you a little clue over here. If you toggled between these two, you might have been able to infer what I was getting at. Some people were not so sure about the answer to this one. They, they weren't really, it's okay if you weren't. <laughs> okay, right. So there, there's a lot of similarity. Typically in a t-test, we know the mean and the standard deviation of our sample. Right? So we have some indication about the mean and the variance there. In a t-test, a one sample t-test, we also know the mean of our reference group. Right, the reference group might be the people who are reading on paper, or the reference group might be all Dennis and student GPAs, right? or the reference group might be some 50% recall rate. We know what the mean is, but we don't know what the variance is. We, we don't know what that, what that variance is. So what we want to do is figure out, are we within striking distance of that one mean? We don't have any information necessarily about the population variance. 
if we do have the information about the population variance and the population mean, we could also we could do a, a lot more, uh, compare a lot more precise comparison by looking at a z test. Right? We could compare our mean and our standard deviation to the population mean and the population variance. And if we knew all of that, we'd have basically four pieces of information: two means, two variances. Here, we have a mean, a variance, a mean, or missing a variance. <laughs> Who's following that? Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, you might use either a T or a Z, depending on how much information you have available to you. And you'll always have your own sample, hopefully. Okay. And on your sample, you can compute your mean and your standard deviation. Your reference group, sometimes all you've got is a mean or some other, some other measure of central tendency. Okay. This is kind of interesting. For a relatively small sample size, this is question three, how does the T distribution compare to the normal distribution, that's the Gaussian distribution, with respect to kurtosis? We haven't talked about that in many weeks. Does anybody want to help us out with that? Kurtosis. Okay, Melanie's got something. Um, I okay, and hopefully you were, you might be able to tell that as, as I'm creating these head ed questions, I'm kind of going slide by slide or nearly so, and so uh, you're right, we've got heavier tails here, okay? Does anybody remember which way that went? That when we have heavier tails, does that make the distribution more leptokurtic or more platykurtic? First who remembers hearing those phrases, leptokurtic and platykurtic? <laughs> okay, right, okay. So if it's leptokurtic, it's gonna have heavier tails. And the way I think about that is when I squeeze this toothpaste, it kind of moves up that way. And when I squeeze that toothpaste it moves up that way, it also pushes more stuff out into the tails, making the tails heavier. All right, um, so it leaps up, it's leptokurtic, right, if I squeeze. And so we have a, a difference in kurtosis. The tail heaviness is different between the Gaussian and the t-test. And then it tends to smooth out. It's an interesting property that the shape of the t-distribution actually does change as your your number of participants goes up as your number of observations goes up, and it gets more and more like the normal distribution. But at lower n, then we have this difference in kurtosis. It's still roughly bell-shaped. It isn't a perfect Gaussian. Roughly bell-shaped. It's still symmetric. It's still unimodal. Okay? Um, but it doesn't have the same kurtosis. Who's following that? Does that work for us? Okay. So it gives us a chance to get back to talk about uh, to kurtosis. We haven't been there in, in quite a while. Okay. Um, in what way is the formula for a one-sample t-test similar to that for a z-score? Anybody want to help us out with that? How are these similar? Right, so here's our t formula. How is that similar to a z? What, what is the formula for a z a z-score? A little times. Okay, the raw score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. That's a z score. Who remembers that little ditty? That all ring a bell? It's been a little while, okay, so it's, it's good to do some review. So in our numerator, we had one thing minus another thing. We had a raw score minus a mean, okay? Look what's coming here. We have um, maybe the observed mean minus some kind of population referent, right? Okay, so we have a difference. Here it would be a raw score minus the mean had this been a, a z score. Now it's uh, our observed mean minus some kind of referent mean. Okay, so we're still getting a difference there. And the difference is some kind of departure from a standardized mean okay, over some kind of measure of variability. Right, this is going to be something like the standard deviation or the, the pooled variability is what we have going on down here. It would be the standard deviation of the z score. Okay? So some kind of difference score, okay? which by the way we might call a signal. And this, I'll plant a seed. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about signal detection theory. And some people who are in S&P have heard about signal detection theory, but we don't always think about it this way. You can think about the signal in signal detection theory or the signal here as the difference between these two. Okay? And then over here, we have some indication of the variance. We might call that the noise. So you can think of a t-test, interestingly, as something like a signal-to-noise ratio. Okay. How much difference do we have up here within some kind of context? And that context is going to be the variability. So we can think of it this way. What's the mean of this group? What's the mean of that group? And how big is that difference in this context? Okay. And that context is driven by, by this. So both for the z-score and for the t-test, a difference over some kind of variability. Who's following that? Yeah? Okay. By the way, you're going to see 
next week, just to plant a, a seed again, that we're going to be doing ANOVAs. We're going to build on our t-tests, and we'll, we'll get to ANOVAs. And we're going to have a computation that you might remember from Psych 200. We're going to have the mean square between over the mean square within. Who remembers doing that in Psych 200? Does that sound roughly familiar? Mean square between over mean square within. We're going to see that's very similar to this. We're going to look at the difference between the groups versus how much variability goes on in a given group. Okay. Again, it's something like a signal-to-noise ratio. Okay, that was question number four from TED Ed. Okay, um, I really enjoyed this trio of questions. It was five, six, and seven. They were all related. I, I hope people um, were able to pull this off. So we're going to now introduce a little bit of Excel syntax to try to help us understand how the T distribution is working. And the Excel syntax for finding the critical value of T is this equals T in. And it takes two parameters. It's going to take a probability, which will be 0.5. That's going to be our favorite probability this semester. And then we put in the degrees of freedom. What happens to the T critical value as the degrees of freedom increase? Can we all yell it out? It gets smaller, OK? Now, I'm going to do something over here, just in case that isn't entirely clear. I'm going to make my degrees of freedom go up. I'm going to put in 1. I'll say my neighbor up here, plus 1. And then now that I have that formula, let me make this really big. I'll make it a little bigger. Okay. This will be my degrees of freedom. Now I'm just going to get a stash going here. Okay, so there's 20 of them just like that. Okay, so that's my degrees of freedom. And over here, I'm going to do something like my T crit value. Okay, the critical value of T, this is the number I've got to beat. If I've got my T, it's got to be bigger than this for this to be statistically significant. I'm going to use the inv family to get any kind of critical value. It could be a chi inv, T inv, F inv, and so forth. So I'll say equals T inv. Okay. And my probability is what? Can you it out? 0.05 always. Okay. Right. And then my degrees of freedom will be my neighbor over here to the right. Okay. And I get some kind of critical value, if I had one degree of freedom on a t-test, I would need to have a t-value of 12.7 uh, to be statistically significant at the 0.05 level. It's following that. Is that working for us? Okay. If I drag this down now, I can take advantage of all of these spatial relationships. As the degrees of freedom are increasing, the critical value for t is decreasing. Okay. All right. So how many people had that idea of working for them? Okay. All right. Then we had a similar kind of question. That was number five. Number six, I cut and paste, but I swapped out everything that was T-oriented and I put in chi-oriented. Right? So we're now going to compare this to another statistic that we had earlier, the, the chi. So uh, we can ask the question, if we were to repeat the exercise for, for the chi-square, what happens to the chi-square critical value as the degrees of freedom are increasing? It increases. It increases. Okay, so let's build that to make sure we're all okay with that. I'll put in chi. And this, again, is the... Uh, critical value, this is the number we've got to beat, equals chi in. I think I need one more i in there. Okay. My probability is 0.05. My degrees of freedom, my neighbor to the left in this case. Okay. I start out at 3.84. I drag that down over the same range, and now this number is going up. Okay. So you can see that in each case, we're increasing the n, but we're having opposite effects on our critical values in a manner that's contingent on whether we're doing a, key, a, a t or a chi. So far, so good. People doing all that? All right. And so the next question was asking you to pull all that together. Um, anybody have an intuition about why that's the case? I don't think I asked you in the question specifically to have an intuition about that, but hopefully in question six, I think it is, you're asked to make that comparison. This is decreasing, that's increasing. Some notion about why that's the case? Yeah, thanks. I was thinking that, so for a t-test, okay. we want to show that the mean, the sample mean is different from the population okay. mean. Uh -huh. You want to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So you'd want a value greater than the critical value. Uh -huh. And for chi-square, if you want to show that um, the groups are independent mm -hmm. or that, um, what did I say, they're not equally likely to influence the dependent variable, you want to retain the null hypothesis. Okay, okay. So you'd want a lower critical value? Okay, I think that works. So you're saying it's almost as if the, these two tests are almost uh, evaluating oppositely oriented mm -hmm. questions. Okay, that's one of the ways of thinking about it. Okay, I think that's, that, that's a pretty good intuition. Some other ideas. Anybody else have a, a notion about this? Okay, this, uh, hopefully this will be intuitive. 
But does anybody remember the formula for the standard error? Not the standard deviation, the standard error. It's been a little while. The standard error is equal to, can you help me out? It's been a little while, but it gives us a chance to review as we're looking at this. And this is going to be relevant to the t-test in particular. The standard error, I'll give you a clue. It is relatable to the standard deviation. It's not the same thing as. The standard error, by the way, was the, the standard deviation of the distribution of means. Who remembers hearing about the distribution of means? Okay. It's been a little while. Okay. Standard error is equal to the SD divided by, anybody recall? Yeah. The, square root of n. The, the square root of n. How many people now remember that? Mm -hmm. As n grows, what happens to the standard error? It gets smaller. People okay with that? As n grows, it gets smaller. As n grows, what happens to the degrees of freedom? It gets bigger. Okay, so, as, so what's going on here, degrees of freedom are growing. As say n is growing, the standard error is getting smaller. Okay, is that working for us? So here's one of the ways of thinking about this. And I can have some difference between two means. This might be you know, some standard mean, and this might be my... Um, my observed mean or my test mean. And it might be the case that these two are not significantly different from each other right, because there's so much overlap between those. Is that working? Okay. But if I increase my n, this goes up, the standard error gets smaller. Okay. Let's leave it like that. And now maybe I can reduce this to the point where that same mean difference all of a sudden now is statistically significant. Right? That, that means haven't changed, but I've shrunk these down, and now that is statistically significant. Okay? So I, a relatively small difference between the mean can all of a sudden become significant if you have a relatively large n. That same difference would not have been significant if you had a smaller n. Right? So hopefully that gives you an intuition about why this is going the way that that is. Okay? Let's see now if we can remember a little bit about how the chi-square is computed. Right? The chi-square is, well, you tell me, what are some of the factors that go into computing the chi-square? Just generally. Whether it's a chi-square test of independence or a chi-square test for goodness of fit, what's generally being compared in a chi-square? Yeah. Observed and expected scores, right? We typically, have, so, so uh, for you know, any given group, we're going to have an observed score, we're going to have the expected score, and we'll find out how those are different from each other, we'll square that, okay? And then we're going to sum those up over the many different groups that we might have. Okay? And the more groups that we have, even if there's just a little bit of departure for any one group, as we get more and more and more groups, we're going to have larger and larger departures. Okay? So you'd have to account for the increasing level of departures. The, the expected deviations are being squared. Uh, uh, deviations from the expected values are being squared. And as we begin to accumulate those, you would need to have a larger value uh, up at the higher end to claim that you've got statistically significant, because you would expect that the groups are going to mismatch a little bit all the time. And if you have a lot of groups, collectively there's going to be a lot of mismatch, so we make an adjustment here. So this is very much like a summation going on down this column. And this is much more akin to this kind of relationship. Right? As n is growing, the standard error is shrinking, smaller and smaller signals can be detected as being statistically significant. Getting back to our up uh, okay? All right. How do people follow that? Is that working for us? Okay, we're going to leave this up and we're going to build on it. We have another trio of questions that was very similar to that last trio. Okay, we're going to now do sort of the flip side. Instead of talking about critical values, we're going to talk about the p-values. Right? These are now the sig values in SPSS. And so our first question was question eight. The Excel syntax for computing the p-value, okay, which is um, the probability of a type one error, also called the sig value in SPSS, uh, is done by the t-dist command, right, equals t-dist, and so there's a whole dist family, right, there's a t-dist, there's a chi-dist, we're going to learn about the f-dist, and so forth, okay? Um, I think we had a norm-dist and a norm-in also when we were doing the normal curve, you might remember those, right? So assuming that the observed t-value equals 5, and assuming one tail, in the t-test, what happens to the p-value as the degrees of freedom increase? Can somebody help us out with that? This is question eight. What happens to the p-value? Decreases. Okay, so we get a decreasing bounds. Why do we build that? I'm going to come over here. 
Okay, and now we're looking at the uh, t value. This, this is still the t family, and this is uh, something like the uh, p value. Okay? This is like the observed observed p. Okay? So equals, and we'll put in t dist, okay? and our uh, X value, we said would be 5 here. I, I gave you a 5 just as a constant. We're going to put in our degrees of freedom. Okay? And we're assuming just for the moment one tail. We could have assumed two. It won't really matter um, if we're just looking at the pattern. Okay? And you were correct to say that it's decreasing. So we have this is increasing, that's decreasing. These two are moving opposite one another. Okay? Maybe that, that makes sense. This was related to a problem that we've returned to a few times. This was called... Uh, at one point, we were jokingly saying there's trouble in paradise. This is the problem with null hypothesis testing. You can have a, a given difference, and as you're increasing your n, all of a sudden, something that was non-significant, way up there at 0.06, a p-value that would not reach the canonical 0.05, all of a sudden now we're getting these really, really significant effects just because we've increased our sample size. That was, I think, also the focus of your first exam. Right? We were uh, asked to write essays about what are some of the limitations associated with null hypothesis testing, and so you see this kind of thing going on here. Okay? And then one more time over on this side, let's do the kindest. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll call this the chi observed p-value. Okay. You tell me what's my syntax? I'll give you this much. Equals? Kindest. Okay. All right. What do I put here? Five, according to the question. Okay. My degrees of freedom, where does that come from? Yeah, column D. Thank you, Gabby. Okay, so two two doors to the left, if you will. I put that in. Okay, 0 0.025. Pull that on down. Okay, now that's increasing. So uh, very much we have this um, difference between chi and t, but hopefully this, this kind of layout makes it available and, and very accessible to you. Who's following all that? Okay. So if we had a difference of five, or we had, I should say we have chi-squares that sum up to, to five, observed minus expected squared, we sum all those up, and it turns out to be five, that's fairly impressive if you only had one degree of freedom. But if you had 20 degrees of freedom, you would get that almost certainly, just by chance, right? is what's going on there. Okay. All right. All right. So that takes us through the next trio of questions. All right, why don't we go to question 11. For a one-sample t-test, what can be inferred when the 95% confidence interval includes zero? Okay, Melanie's got something. Uh, it can be inferred that the null hypothesis is true. Okay, the null hypothesis being that our, our sample mean is going to be statistically indistinguishable from the overall mean, the, our comparison mean. Okay? And this is something that I think we can, we can draw and see quite obviously. We're looking for some kind of a difference score, the difference between our sample mean and the, the referent mean. So we'll go back to Karen's case. We want to know something about the psychology sample that we have of GPAs versus some standard which might be the overall campus mean. And we can um, say that we're looking at <clears throat> some sort of a difference score, some kind of a difference score. Okay. And we'll position this here at zero. Okay. And you can imagine that if you took a whole bunch of psychology students and you difference their scores with the overall GPA, they could have all ended up here. Right? And we wind up with a mean that might be there, and there might be plus or minus some value. That can be a standard error. That could be a 95% confidence interval. But notice that it's comfortably away from zero. It could have been that the psychology GPA was way down here. And again, this is some kind of indication of dispersion. It could be a standard error. It could be a 95% confidence interval. Let's just say, though, that we did have an observed mean that was on the low side. When we differenced our scores, we came in lower. But the 95% confidence interval was really, really big, and it actually covered zero. Right? The null hypothesis is calling for a zero difference between your sample mean and the referent mean. Okay, so now the 95% confidence interval encompasses that zero. Probably your sample is not different from the referent. Who's following all that? Is that working? Yeah, okay. All right, so that's what's implied there in, in question 11. Okay, a couple more. We have a few minutes. Why don't we see how far we can get? Equal variance is an assumption that underlies independent samples t-tests. In your own words, explain why this assumption is necessary. No formulas, just, just some logic here. 
Anybody want to, that's a pretty good critical thinking question. Anybody want to tackle that one or give it a try? Okay, thanks, Victoria. Um, okay. And so if the variance is not equal, then the two groups can never be kind of comparable. Okay, and why not? Yeah. You, you're right. You're spot on. You're spot on. And so why is that the case that you really can't compare them? Okay, I think I'm following. I think I'm following. She's got us on a really good start, and she's most of the way there. She might even be all the way there. Anybody else want to add to that? A add any idea to that? Some people are not entirely sure why it's the case that these things have to be equal. We know that we are told you have to have equal variance. Okay? Some people are not entirely sure why we are told that. Is that, is that any confusion about that? Some people are sure why we are told that. How many people aren't voting? <laughs> okay, all right. All right, I think Victoria was, was really on it. Why don't I draw one last picture? How are we doing on time? Okay, we'll, we'll try this idea. It's a little bit complicated, but not too complicated. I think we can do it with pictures and really with no numbers. I'm gonna draw two different groups that have a mean difference, we'll call that our signal, and I'm gonna give them some variance. This would be the denominator of our F statistic, it would be the denominator of our T statistic, something like that. And I'm going to try to make that width about the same as this width. Okay? Equal variance so far? Okay. So one way of thinking about it is kind of like this. Imagine that this is going to be our step size. Okay? This thing is one, two, three, four steps away from that. This mean is four z scores higher than that. Is that working for us? Okay. And this thing is one, two, three, four z scores higher than that one because this variance is the same as that one. But suppose I were to do this, and only that. Now we've got a relatively fat variance over here and a much thinner variance. According to this context, I'd step down one, two, three, four, and I'd be here. But according to this really small step size, I have to go up not four, but I have to go up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or something like that. So it's eight steps up here to get there, but four steps down given that step size to get there. Who's following that? Yeah? So it's almost like saying, that I am four steps to the east of Victoria, and she is 17 steps to the west of me. That's pretty nonsensical, right? And that's the kind of nonsense you run into when you have unequal variances. And that's why they have that. So I wonder if that's what you're, kind of what you're stating? Yeah? All right, and we're out of time. So we can pick up on that idea on Wednesday when we're back in this context for Monday. Please remember that we've got Dr. Hudson Como's article on gender stereotypes, that will be our TED Ed, and then we'll go to Karen's, Karen's presentation. Have a great weekend, thanks for a great week.